Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have a real treat for you all. We have Alistair Kroll with us, and he's going to be talking to you all about five things you need to know about startup analytics. Alistair is the author of the brand new O'Reilly book, Lean Analytics. He's been an entrepreneur, author, and public speaker for nearly 20 years. He's worked on a variety of topics, from web performance to big data to cloud computing to startups in that time. In 2001, he co-founded the web performance startup, Coradient, and since that time, he has also launched RedNod, CloudOps, BitCurrent, Year One Labs, the BitNorth Conference, the International Startup Festival, and several other early stage companies. Alistair is the author of three best-selling books on web performance, analytics, and IT operations, and is also chair of O'Reilly Media Strata Conference. We're really excited to have Alistair with us today, folks, to present this webcast for you all. Okay, as we get things started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Alistair. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Alistair, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure he sees them for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you would like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, our hashtag is Lean Analytics. If you should have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have problems, just post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we'll have the archive ready within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Alistair for his presentation. Hello, Alistair. Hi, Yasmina, and thank you very much. All right, uh, so I have a lot of content to cover today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, Lean Analytics is a book that uh, Ben Yoskovitz and I have been working on for the last year. Uh, it has been a labor of love and, and a fascinating journey. We've spent a lot of time talking to founders and investors and, and hearing some of the sort of unvarnished stories of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the book was really inspired by um, the work that Eric Ries has done on, on Lean Startup um, and the desire to make that sort of more concrete and tangible by saying, look, these are the metrics you should actually measure um, for the kind of business you're in, for the stage that you're at. Uh, ben has been writing about entrepreneurship for uh, over a decade, very, very smart guy in this space. He has a blog called Instigator Blog. Um, and um, the book is finally ready. Uh, it's been an amazing uh, labor of love to get this thing out. and. I can't really get into all the details here, so I'm going to try and sort of skim the tips of the waves. Uh, ben and I are, are not shy, so if you want to uh, yell at him or I uh, on Twitter or in chat or wherever else, um, feel free to do so. Um, we're also heading off to, I think he's going to Amsterdam next week. I'm going to uh, South by Southwest and then to Tokyo. and So we're spending a lot of time on the road, so hopefully, as I see in the chat, all these people coming in from all over the world, hopefully we can meet you guys um, in a corner of the world to uh, laugh and drink and plan our futures, as Simple Minds once said. Um, I will get going with this stuff. If you have comments or questions, you can yell at me on Twitter. You can yell at me um, here in the chat room or um, offline elsewhere or on our blog. So the core idea of Lean Analytics is that you should use data to build a better business faster. Uh, the, the subtitle on the book says Startup, but this really does apply to any business, and we talk to a lot of uh, enterprise customers about how they use it as well. Um, so uh, first thing I want to underscore is that the Lean Analytics um, and the Lean Startup model 
is based on this very simple premise. Don't, make what you, don't sell what you can make, make what you can sell. Kevin Costner's Field of Dreams model of if you build it, they will come is a bad model because in a world where um, we are starved of, uh, we're full of information and starved of attention, the biggest risk of any undertaking is whether people will actually care. If I said to you, I'm going to build a Facebook um, competitor, you probably these days go, yeah, you know, he probably knows a couple of coders, he can build something. But will anybody care? Probably not. And so attention is really the scarce commodity. And as a result, um, the new Kevin Costner rule should be, if they come, you will build it, because customer development helps you to understand exactly what um, needs to happen out there. Now, in the traditional world of analytics, um, we define analytics as simply the measurement of movement towards your business goals. And analytics has traditionally been seen as a very technological field. There's actually a lot of examples that aren't technology. So this is a restaurant uh, owned by a friend of mine in San Diego called Solare. Um, this restaurant is the, the guy who owns it. It's Randy Smerick, um, was once the general manager of Teradata. So as you might ex imagine, he's a little more numbers driven than most people. Uh, but I love this example because it really demonstrates that analytics is not something that's just the purview of um, the the startup tech world. First of all, I was at the restaurant a little while ago, and uh, his son Tommy uh, yelled to him, "Hey, Dad, 24." And Randy went, "Oh, great!" And being a numbers guy, I said, "Well, that's an interesting number. What the hell does that mean?" And um, Randy explained to me that the ratio of um, their uh, labor cost to gross revenue um, is a number they look at every day. So if it's under 30%, that's really good. If less than 30% of the money they made that night went to salaries of employees that worked that night, that's a good thing. Below 20%, you might be understaffing the company, uh, the, the restaurant. Over 30% is bad. Now, this is a really good indicator because you can change your hiring the next night or you can increase the margins on the goods or try to push the expense of wine more within a day. And so that's a very good metric you can use to sort of track your business. The next day, Randy got an email from his son uh, at around 5.15 that said 50. And Randy said, oh, good. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, we've learned in our business that um, the current number of reservations at 5 p.m., if you multiply that by five, that's roughly the number of people who will eat in our restaurant that day. So that's a leading indicator. He knows that at 5 p.m., if he has 50 reservations, he's going to have 250 covers that night. Now, that ratio naturally varies by market. I mean, if you're McDonald's, you have no reservations. Um, if you are uh, Daniel Bouloud or some uh, highly sought-after high-end restaurant, you're probably 100% reservations. But for many restaurants in the middle, this is a good indicator, and it actually allows them to go and buy more food or to ask someone else to come in that evening. Um, and so all of these things are, are leading indicators that Randy can use to try and improve the business. So here's a great example of two business metrics tied to the fundamentals of a restaurant that Randy can use to quickly optimize his business on a short-term basis and to predict what's going to happen to the business so he can optimize it. I love these examples because those are really simple. They're not technical, and yet they're the kind of things that most restaurants don't really think about. Um, or if they do, they know them implicitly as sort of rules of thumb rather than something explicit. So um, the change here in the startup world is that analytics aren't just to um, get people to move towards your business model. It's not just measuring their movement towards the business model. It's specifically figuring out what you should build before your money runs out. The whole idea of lean analytics is that you're not really building a product or sorry, Lean Startup is that you're not building a product. You're building something to figure out what product to build. And that's a big difference. And the reason it's so important is that in many startup worlds, we don't know what business we're in. I mean, take some of these examples, right? Um, one of the – sorry, I'm moving too fast on the slides here. Here we go. So uh, one of the examples is uh, a company like PayPal, which was first built for Palm Pilots. Um, another example might be FreshBooks, uh, originally a web design firm that happened to have an invoicing system. Uh, Wikipedia, the original business model was for it to be written by experts only. Mitel, one of my favorite examples, a telecommunications company, uh, was started by Terry Matthews and Michael Copeland of Newbridge and Corel, respectively. Um, Mitel was a lawnmower company. It actually stands for Mike and Terry's Lawnmowers. And when they realized that remote control drone, drone lawnmowers should not be driving around the suburbs, they switched to this business model. Uh, Hotmail was a database company. The founders simply created the web-based email as a way of talking to one another during their day jobs. And it turns out the database wasn't interesting, but Hotmail was. Uh, Flickr was going to be a massively multiplayer online game, but it turned out people were uploading a lot of pictures there. 
Uh, Twitter, as everyone knows, was a podcasting company, and Autodesk, if you've ever wondered why a design company was called Autodesk, it's because it started out making desktop automation. And so all of these companies had no idea what they were going to be when they grew up, which is why the early stages of product development are really figuring out what product you're going to build when you grow up and figuring out what market you're going to sell it to. So I'm going to talk about five things that you really need to know about Lean Analytics in today's conference call. Um, and obviously there's a lot more detail to this. Uh, the book is uh, much thicker than we would like because there are a lot of uh, it depends that we had to cover. So I'm going to try and keep this succinct. I'm going to talk about what makes a good metric. I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between cohorts and segments, which is really important for people to understand much more than they realize. Uh, I'm going to talk about a concept we have in the book called the Business Model Flipbook, which is a way of understanding the business you're in. I'm going to talk briefly about the Lean Analytics Framework, and then I'm going to explain why it's essential to pick the one metric that matters to your business. So let's get started. A metric, um, there's a number of things that make a good one, but uh, some things that are really important about metrics. They need to be clear and comparable. They need to be tied to your business model. They need to be actionable, not vain. Uh, they either need to be correlated or causal of something, and they need to be leading or lagging. So let me explain what I mean by those. First of all, think about a car. If you're driving a car, in the U.S. at least, then you know 60 miles per hour is twice as fast as 30 miles per hour. Uh, within a country, speed limits and mileage are well understood. 100 kilometers an hour is a nice line. Um, you know, we can divide that easily. It's conveniently decimal. Um, miles map well to hours, so 60 miles an hour in 60 uh, minutes in an hour tells me exactly how long I'm going to get if I know the speed I'm driving. Those things are also good because they're rates. If I know miles traveled, that's good. If I know miles per hour, that's better. And if I know whether my miles per hour is changing, that tells me whether I'm accelerating or decelerating, which is a very tactical thing that allows me to drive the car. So ratios and rates tend to be better. They tend to not go up and to the right. If I'm driving a car, the number of miles I've traveled just keeps going up and to the right on a graph. But the miles per hour I'm currently at is a ratio, and therefore it's a much better number for understanding my progress. Um, I, my car could be being pushed by people because the engine has broken down, and I would still see the miles traveled going up and to the right. What I'm really interested in is the rate of change in miles traveled, which is a ratio. The third thing is uh, business model. Uh, so if you have a business model that says, I want to drive as fast as possible without getting my car impounded, uh, then you could measure driving a car as something like miles per hour divided by speeding tickets. Um, so you've tied the metric you're tracking, say in this case miles per hour divided by speeding tickets, uh, to your business model, which is drive as fast as possible without losing my license. And so the first thing a metric needs to be is clear, rate-based, and tied to your business model. The second thing, and you've probably heard a less polite word than vanity for this, um, is a metric needs to be actionable. Now, I hate the word actionable. It used to mean one can be sued, um, but since George W. Bush decided it was a part of the word uh, of the lexicon and it got into the Oxford English Dictionary, I will use it. Um, actionable means you will do something. Vanity metrics, which are all too common, um, make you feel good but don't change how you're actually going to act. So this is a bit of an eye chart, but uh, briefly, there are a number of leftovers from the dot-com days that we used to pay attention to, like hits and page views and visits that were nice and made us feel good until we hit the wall at a million miles an hour. For example, uh, if I have 50 visits, is that one person visiting 100 times or 100 people visiting once? What's the math there? Um, you also care about things like what you can get someone to do. For example, if I have a million emails but no one will do what I tell them when I send those emails, that's not as interesting as 100 people who I can mail and they'll do exactly what I say. Um, so there are other me measurements like engagement, which is you know, how much time people spend on the site might not be as indicative as how much time they spend interacting with specific features that you consider useful. Uh, they may be spending a lot of time on your support pages because your product is hard to use. That's not a good metric. So it's very important to say, uh, in summary of all this, if it won't change how you behave, it is fundamentally a bad metric. Um, and that's at the core of understanding what metric to track. So I'll give you another case study of doing this um, to validate a hypothesis. Airbnb, as many of you know, is a hugely successful business focused on letting people rent their houses to others. But they spend a lot of time being driven by data. So for example, um, Airbnb had an idea once. They said, you know what? I bet you we could take professional photography um, and make money out of that. I bet you we could take pictures professionally of the homes that our customers, our renters want to rent and as a result of that, um, we would uh, see an increase in rental. And that sounded like a pretty good test. And so they decided to run an experiment. 
Um, and basically the experiment consisted of um, building something called a concierge MVP. And a concierge MVP is simply the minimum viable product it takes to understand whether or not a particular um, event is uh, useful. So uh, it's just enough work to validate or repudiate a hypothesis. So they set up what looked like a product feature, but it was actually just a bunch of photographers running around taking pictures. And they compared the properties before and after with the professional pictures to other listings in that area and found that professionally photographed listings got two to three more times bookings than the market average. Now, if you're Airbnb and you have data like this, is this a useful metric? Of course it is, because you're going to roll this feature out to everybody. That's hugely viable. So it's not a vanity metric because you know what you're going to do. We're going to run this test. If it's better, we'll roll this out as a service. Um, and if you look at the growth of uh, Airbnb, you can see that this was a huge point for them. It really drove that massive, massive increase. So um, let me give you an example of another problem with metrics. I'm going to tell you a few words about causality. Let's imagine for a minute that you're the mayor of a sleepy New England town, and you're a little OCD, so you measure everything. You measure things like um, how many people are in your town and how many seats you rent and how much time people spend at the beach and how much ice cream they eat and how often they swim, every metric you could imagine. And you notice that you have a problem. Your problem is people are drowning, and you've eliminated the usual causes of drowning in sleepy New England towns. So you're kind of perplexed. You have to fix this. It's bad for tourism. It's not about great white sharks. And so one day, one of your staffers notices that there's this interesting correlation. He's measuring ice cream sales. And he notices that ice cream sales are directly related to the number of drownings you see. In fact, he plots this out on a graph. And he says, hey, we have this huge issue here where um, the more ice cream people eat, the more likely they are to drown. And you say, that's an interesting correlation. Because now I can call up the funeral home and say, hey, guys, we've seen a spike in ice cream sales. You better dig a few plots. Or you can say, hey, ice cream guys. Um, we noticed that a few more people have died, you may want to stock up on Rocky Road. Now, this seems ridiculous because it is. There probably isn't a correlation between ice cream consumption and drowning, although it's clear that I spend far too much time on Twitter, uh, uh, sorry, on Flickr, because I was able to find a picture of an ice cream on a beach called Chow Bella, um, and that takes way too much of my spare time. But of course, there is a correlation, and the correlation is uh, simply that both ice cream consumption and drowning peak during the summer months. In other words, ice cream consumption and drowning are correlated, but they're not caused. The causal relationship is the temperature and, by consequence, the uh, summer weather. And so this tells you you can train people for CPR in the spring, you can hire some more lifeguards in the summer, and if you still believe a little in correlation, you can locate your lifeguard stand next to your ice cream shop. Again, proof that I spend far too much time looking for pictures on Flickr. Now, the difference here is that metrics that are correlated are good and metrics that are causal are good. These are both good things, but the, they are used for very different purposes. Um, correlated metrics allow me to understand how things change in relation to one another. Causal metrics allow me to tweak one metric and produce a change in the other. So summertime, for example, is a cause of ice cream consumption and drowning. Um, and I can figure out the relationship there, whereas ice cream consumption and drowning, I can simply use them to predict one another. Granted, a ridiculous example. Let me give you a more concrete one. Um, in Houston Airport, they had a huge problem with people waiting for their bags. Uh, when, they, when they surveyed people at the, the airport, they found that the majority of complaints were related to people um, waiting a long time for their bags. In average, they had to wait eight minutes. Now, this might sound like a bit of a first world problem, but Houston wanted to fix this, and so they did everything they could to squeeze efficiencies into the baggage handling supply chain. They got the time down significantly. People still complained, even though they were just killing themselves to get bags off the plane and onto the carousel as quickly as possible. People still complained. They still got tons and tons of complaints. And then they tried parking the airplanes further from the gate. And it turns out that if you make people walk, they don't complain. So airplanes that were parked further from the gate, complaints went to zero. In this case, the cause of the problem was not slow delivery of baggage. The cause of the problem was a long time spent waiting. And if you think about the money they invested in trying to improve the delivery time to the gate, uh, to, the, to the carousel, versus the time it would have taken to run a test and have planes park a little further from the baggage carousel and measure the complaints of those passengers versus others, um, the cost to run that test would be very low. So, one of the key insights we found in talking to people at the book is that correlations are not always what you think. Causality is not always what you think. And you can often find an unexpected causality um, 
and use that to your advantage when, marching your, uh, when launching your product and so on. So um, causality, I really think, is a superpower because it lets you change the future. What Randy was able to say about predicting the future when he said, I have 50 uh, seats at 5 p.m., was great because that allowed him to predict the future. I know how many people will be in my restaurant. I can buy some food. But causality lets you change the future. If Randy were able to say, if I doubled reservations, I would have 500 people in the restaurant, then he could invest in a campaign that would double reservations. So generally what startups do is they find some kind of a correlation. Then they try to test causality, and then they go and optimize that causal factor. And you may have heard this term growth hacking, which is the latest word for sort of um, subversive marketing. The reality is that growth hacking is all about doing these uh, iterative cycles of uh, finding a correlation, testing the causality, and then optimizing that causal factor. So a good metric should either be causal or correlated. There's another aspect of this, which is the difference between a leading and a lagging metric. And we've talked about this. Uh, a leading metric um, is one that will show you what's going to happen, um, like the reservations. And a lagging metric, a historical metric, shows you how you've done, like the ratio of um, wait staff to revenues. Remember, however, that in many organizations, your leading metric may be someone else's lagging metric. For example, if you're in sales, the pipeline is a leading indicator of um, what your revenues will be for the quarter, hopefully. For um, the sales team, uh, sorry, for the collections team, the sales is a leading indicator of how much money they will collect. Um, so, so everybody has different sets of metrics in the business, and knowing whether you're looking at a leading or a lagging metric is important. Let me give you a concrete example of a good leading metric. If you're running an e-commerce shop, one of the most important things you need to know, as Kevin Hillstrom told us when we talked to him, is um, what mode of e-commerce you're in. You might be in a loyalty mode, and if you're in loyalty mode, your real job is to understand the – uh, customer and get them to keep coming back and buying from you. So you're an online grocery, for example, people come back every week, you're definitely loyalty focused. On the other hand, if you are in a, um, an acquisition focused thing, then your customers don't buy from you frequently. You might be selling engagement rings. Hopefully, if you believe in uh, happy marriages, people aren't buying more than one engagement ring, and so you're going to have a one-time sale to that person. And so there you've got to worry about your cost of customer acquisition and getting as much money out of them for that one transaction. Neither one of those is bad. It's not bad to be an acquisition-focused e-commerce company. It's not bad to be a, um, a loyalty-focused e-commerce company. It's bad not to know which one you are because you pour money down the wrong marketing drain. So an easy way to tell this is simply to say, how many of your customers buy a second time from you in 90 days? If your customers buy from you, um, only 1% to 15% of your customers buy from you a second time in 90 days, then you're likely in the acquisition mode. Uh, your customers will buy from you once. You're like 70% of the retailers out there, and you need to focus on lowering your cost of customer acquisition and maximizing your conversion rates and how much people pay for something. Pretty simple, right? If you're in this sort of 15 to 30% in 90 days, then your customers will buy from you two to two and a half times a year. You're just like 70% of retailers, and you focus on increasing the, time, the, the number of times they come back. Zappos, for example, would be in this space. And if your customers buy more than 30 times in 90 days, that means they're buying from you more than two and a half times a year. You're loyalty focused, and you really worry about things like inventory expansion. So if you're Amazon, for example, where people go back a lot, you create services like Prime, you diversify into cookware, you change all these other aspects of your business. This doesn't seem obvious, right? But nobody bothers to do this measurement. And all you need to do is just ask, what percentage of people buy from me a second time in 90 days? And you will know where you need to focus all your marketing efforts. So this is a great leading indicator because you're doing it in 90 days. You don't have a full year's benefit of experience, but you understand very well what you should focus on next, and that's huge. And this is a concept that comes up through in all the growth hacking um, conferences that we've seen. Uh, here's a list of them from Facebook and Zynga and Dropbox and Twitter and LinkedIn. All of these organizations look at a metric like how many of my users followed a certain number of people in their first few days? Or how many of those people signed up for a game and then played it on the second day? Or how many people put files in their Dropbox? This allows them to predict the future much better and understand the kind of customers they've got and the kind of business they're in. Okay, I want to move on to a second topic here. We've talked about what makes a good metric, correlated, leading, and so on. Um, a second aspect of this is segmentation. So uh, one of the really important concepts here is how to understand how to divide things. And you may think you know what segmentation is, but let me um, suggest that maybe there's some, um, some subtleties you don't know as much about as you thought you did. 
This rather uh, complicated diagram has four elements to it. I'll try and explain them. First of all, if you look at users arriving on your site, the lightest blue at the bottom is the users that come in January, and then the next blue is the users that come in February, and then March, and then April, and then May. Looking at the teal colored, the fourth band here that says cohort, um, the cohorts of users coming to your site are basically all the users that in this case came in April. So there's something they've got in common. Now that cohort could be all the users that came from Twitter or all the users that came from a certain campaign. But a good common metric is to look at all the users that came in April. Because the people who had an experience starting in June changed dramatically from the people who um, had an experience starting in April. And so you want to compare those to see if things are getting better for a particular cohort. We're fairly familiar with segmenting a market. So for example, you could apply a test and show people a red or a green button and see what happened. Um, and that's sort of A-B testing, very simple. Uh, or you can segment all of your users across a particular seg uh, dimension. So you can say all male versus all female users. But remember that you're conflating users who arrived in January with those that came in April. And then more common when you don't have a ton of traffic is multivariate analysis, where you change several things at once, and then you look to see if those correlate with any particular um, set of results. And this is what a lot of analysts spend their time doing. When you're a startup, because you're changing frequently, cohorts is hugely important. So I want you to take a look at this screen and ask yourself, is this company, based on the information you see here, growing, stagnating, or shrinking? Its revenues per customer in January were $5. That dropped down to $4.50 in February, $4.33 in March, $4.25 in April, back up to $4.50 in May. So most people would say it's stagnating or you know, they had some hiccups after their initial launch and then it grew. And if this is all the information you have, you're going to look at this company as an investor, you might pass. I mean, this seems like this company is pretty boring, right? This is a critical problem because if I now show you this information that looks at the cohort of users, and I say, here's the users that came in January. So the users that came in January, in their first month, they spent five bucks. In their second month, they spent three bucks. Then they spent two bucks. Then they spent one buck. Then they spent 50 cents. February users started out spending six, dropped down to one. March users started out spending seven, dropped down to five, and so on. This paints a very different picture because my May users are spending $9 in their first month. I've almost doubled the first month revenue per user. That's amazing. And the drop off in revenues has changed substantially, going from five down to $2. Instead, by March, we're going from seven down to $5. So this other company looks like it's doing really well, and I'd invest immediately. The amazing thing is that if you assume that we add 1,000 customers per month, these are the same company. If you take an average of these numbers, you'll see that the numbers in the top row are the same as the numbers below. We just didn't analyze them by, co by cohort. This is a huge issue, and let me make it a little more obvious. If I now take those cohorts and I slide them and I organize them, as you can see on this slide, by the numbers, so first, second, third, fourth, fifth month, you now see a real picture of what's going on with the company, which is that it's doing pretty well and that the averages are very different. So, this idea of segmenting is great, but analyzing cohorts is vital because the company is changing so quickly, it's a new company each month, and you need to analyze that new company each month. And you would be amazed that the number of people um, out there had, uh, you'd be amazed the number of people out there who don't understand cohorts, and as a result, um, dilute their business model or give up on something, or even invest in something that's flawed as well. All right. The next important topic we talk about in the book is knowing what business you're in. And again, this sounds pretty basic. Um, one of the concepts that we came up with to help people understand this, because in the book we talk about um, six fundamental business models, and I'll get to those in a minute, is that you can define a business model kind of the way those children's books work, where you have the head, the body, and the feet of a monster, and you sort of flip through the different faces to build strange creatures. Um, if everybody remembers those kinds of business, uh, those kinds of flip books. Basically, you can define a business model in the same way. You can say, what's my revenue model? How do I take money from somebody? Uh, what's my product type? What do I give them back in return? How do I get it to them? How do they learn about me? And how do I convince them to buy? And you can add other things to this list, but this is a pretty good high-level list. And we use this list to sort of construct six business models. The next slide is a bit of an eye chart, but I'll explain it anyway, and hopefully you guys can see it. Um, but the, the idea on the next slide is that um, we're talking here about a – I'm going to try and push this to you. Here we go. So we're talking here about specific uh, elements of this. So first of all, the acquisition channel. How does the visitor, the customer, or the user find out about me? 
Um, that could be through things like paid advertising, search engine man uh, management and, and um, search engine optimization, social media outreach, built-in virality or word of mouth, affiliate marketing, PR, the app ecosystem, and so on. And I've provided some examples of those here. That doesn't tell you anything about the business model. It just tells you this is the acquisition channel. Um, the next one is the startup tactic. Uh, what does the startup actually do to convince, sorry, the selling tactic. What does the startup uh, do to convince the visitor or the user to become a paying customer? So many people say, I have a freemium business model. No, you don't. You have a freemium selling tactic. Um, that selling tactic could be a simple purchase. Please buy something. Uh, it could be more uh, complex. It could be something like, I'm going to give you a discount, or it's a free trial, or like SlideShare, it's a free tool, but you can pay me for money if you want to keep the, pri the slides private. Uh, or if you're Air Mac, for example, you could say I'm free to play, but you can buy in-game stuff. The next section of this flip book um, is the revenue model. How does the startup attract money uh, from its visitors? So it may be a one-time transaction, I'm just going to buy something. It could be a subscription, it could be a consumption charge like cloud computing where you pay by compute hour, uh, it could be pay-per-click advertising, uh, it could be user resale like Twitter selling the fire hose, it could be a donation model like Reddit Gold or Wikipedia. Um, and again, these are, not, these are just elements of your business model. Um, what's the kind of product? So there's obviously a lot of different kinds of products in the world, um, everything from software platform, merchandising, user-generated content, um, two-sided marketplace, media or content, and so on. And uh, finally, the delivery model. How does the product actually get to the customer? So in, in the tech world, this is often a hosted service. It could be digital delivery like Valve sending you a desktop game. It could be a physical uh, delivery. The point here is that there are many dimensions to a business, and people say, I'm using a freemium business model. They're, they're dramatically oversimplifying or missing the point. No, you're using freemium as a selling tactic. And so if I were to take Dropbox, for example, um, I could turn the pages as follows. I could say Dropbox has inherent virality, meaning you share files with others and they're urged to get an account, as well as artificial virality. I'm going to invite my friends because I get incented by free storage when I invite them. The selling tactic is freemium. You get a certain amount of storage for free, and you subscribe when you need more, and there's a natural upgrade path of people filling up their Dropboxes. You may notice that Dropbox has features like when you plug in your mobile device, it says, would you like to automatically sync these photos to your Dropbox? because that moves you past the freemium barrier sooner. Uh, the revenue model is a recurring subscription. Uh, it's $99 a year or monthly fees with enterprise tiers and pay more for more storage. Uh, the product type is obviously a platform. It's a storage as a service thing. It has APIs, collaboration, synchronization tools. And their delivery model is both a hosted service in the form of the cloud service and digital delivery in the form of a desktop client software. So this is a good way to sort of grok their business model. So we sat down and we looked at the business models that are out there on the web and we tried to identify some fundamental business models. And we knew that um, those business models drove some of the metrics, just like Randy's restaurant cares a lot about covers and staff salaries and reservations. Each of these business models cares about some specific dimensions. And then we looked at the work that Eric Ries had done in the Lean Startup and he defined something called the three engines of growth. So the three engines of growth are this. First of all, stickiness. If you want to use stickiness as an engine of growth, make your product so good everyone will keep coming back. And basically the metric you care about is can you get customers faster than you lose them? Are you sticky? The second metric is, the second engine of growth, sorry, is virality. Figure out a way to make people invite their friends. And the metric here is how many people your existing users invite, how fast they invite them. And then the third one is price, which is obviously make money from your customers and pour some of it back into advertising or some other customer acquisition model. And if you do that, um, you just need to know that your customers are worth more than they cost to get in the first place. Seems pretty obvious, right? So we took these ideas and we built something we call the, the five stages of lean analytics. First of all, you need to know the stage you're at. And we took Eric's models and we put them in a specific order. Uh, the first order is empathy. So, hey, can you get inside your customer's head? This is the first stage. Um, can you get inside your customer's head, understand the problem they have, and understand how they feel about the solution you're proposing? Then can you build something sticky that will encourage them to keep coming back? Can you make that thing viral? Um, can you find revenue from it which you can pour back into uh, customer acquisition? And finally, can you scale? Which means, can you do things where others are helping you? So channel sales, referral, things that you're not directly involved in, uh, going into new industries and so on. And that tells you the five stages. And there's very different metrics you care about, early versus late. 
And then the other dimension that you care about is the business you're in. And we identified six sort of archetypes of online business. And those include things like e-commerce, um, two-sided marketplaces, software as a service, a mobile application with in-game purchasing, um, user-generated content sites, and um, media. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. We're not going to go into all the details here. But the bottom line is that knowing those two dimensions will tell you the one metric that matters to your business. Here's an example, again, a bit of an eye chart, but I'll walk you through it, of a restaurant. So um, before opening, the restaurant owner first learns about the diners in their area, the desires, what foods are available, trends in eating, gets inside the head of customers to figure out what kind of restaurant to start. Then he develops a menu and tests it out with consumers, making frequent adjustments. So basically, he's giving things away. He's walking around the room, trying things out, asking diners what they think. His costs are going to be higher because of variance, because of uncertain inventory. He's probably also not signing long-term commitment contracts with people. He's not getting locked into the economies of scale that come later. Um, we've even seen people who launch a food truck first because that's the cheapest way to experiment with this stuff with different crowds and different meals. You can change what you are by painting the side of your truck. And then once they've nailed that down, it's time to launch a restaurant. Then he starts loyalty programs to bring frequent diners back, to encourage people to share with their friends. He cares about things like Yelp and Foursquare and word of mouth and so on. Um, once he's got some virality and he knows that every time he attracts a customer, it will lead to additional customers, uh, he works on things like uh, margins, fewer free meals, tighter costs on controls, uh, controls on costs, more standardization, and then pumping some of that into more traditional advertising spots. And finally, with scale, he can run a profitable business and he can pour some of those revenues into other elements. So he can reach out to food reviewers, travel magazines, radio stations, and most importantly, he can launch a second restaurant or a franchise based on the initial one, and that's where he's scaling the business. This is a natural evolution of a restaurant. Unfortunately, it's not how most restaurants start, which is why most restaurants have a very high failure rate. But this is an idea of doing things in the right order. Now let's look at a second example a little closer to the tech world. So um, first of all, um, I'm going to look at a software company, Empathy Stage. So the founder, maybe she worked in a particular industry or has worked with existing solutions, finds some kind of unmet need. And so she meets with an initial group of prospects. She signs contracts that look a lot like consulting agreements. There's a lot of variety in what she's agreeing to do and so on. She's careful not to commit to anything. She tries to steer customers towards a standard set of offerings, but she does have to deal with getting um, enterprise customers um, to use the product um, along a set of uh, parameters that she thinks exist. So she's charging heavily for custom features. She's doing direct customer support. Engineering is answering the phone here, um, and we're really focused on making the product stable, getting people to love it, lowering the number of the volume of inbound calls. Once the product has been built, she gets references from those satisfied customers and uses them as testimonials. She employs a direct sales force. She grows the customer base. She has a user group. She starts to automate support. She has an API to encourage third-party development and so on. Once that's happening, she focuses on growing the pipeline, uh, focuses on sales margins, revenues, are we bringing that in, um, how much of our marketing spend goes towards customer acquisition, how effective are those campaigns. But increasingly, there's a lot of automation or off-sourcing or, or, or offshoring um, where uh, feature enhancements are, are, in, and ha are evaluated based on things like payoff, uh, development cost, less about volume of customer acquisition. Um, and increasingly, the amount of license and support revenue becomes a bigger and bigger component of overall revenues. And then finally, at scale, she signs deals with large distributors. She gets global consulting firms like IBM and CGI to, to integrate their tool. Um, she goes to trade shows. She collects leads. But this is a much bigger scale operation. And again, this is the path that companies should move forward. And if you can't get past a particular um, point, uh, as Peter is saying in the chat, working at a company that got stuck at the stickiness stage, if you can't get people sticky, you've got to keep iterating and decide, am I right to stay here? Should I pivot? Should I change product? Should I change market? Should I take my money and go home? Now, here's a concrete example. Uh, a company called uh, Local Mind, which is um, one of the five companies that launched out of a startup accelerator that Ben and I ran with two other partners in Montreal called Year One Labs, um, was acquired by Airbnb uh, last summer. Local Mind is a way of asking questions about a location. And so when they started the company, they were like, we'd love to say, hey, people in Times Square, is the weather good? So they looked at how much software they're going to have to build to do that, and it was going to take a while. And instead, they said, you know what, we're just going to hack Twitter. So they looked at people checking in on Twitter, and they said, hey, you're in Times Square. Um, could you tell me whether the weather is good? Could you tell me if there's Wi-Fi? Could you tell me if it's busy right now? Could you tell me if there's a subway station nearby? 
And they were able to measure what percentage of the people they asked gave them an answer. Because their question was, will people answer a question from a stranger? Turns out a very large number of people will talk to strangers. Uh, despite what they tell you about New Yorkers, I guess they're pretty friendly on their phones. And so they sent these messages. They asked questions that were generic enough. The response rate was very high, and that was enough to sort of eliminate that risk and move forward without any development, uh, which was great because the guys who started this company are great coders, and their natural instinct is to go and code. Give you an example of something at the stickiness stage. That was sort of empathy. At the stickiness stage, um, here's a company called WP Engine. Uh, full disclosure, they help us host our website. Um, and WP Engine um, had a, was losing a quarter of its customers a year. At first, they thought that was a pretty bad thing, and they were kind of worried about it. And so they were trying to focus on things like, how do I um, minimize my churn rate? I don't want to lose a quarter of my customers every year. But when they asked around, they found out that actually 2% customers lost a month is very good in the industry. So the founder, Jason Cohen, called people and said, look, um, we found out why people are leaving. And then he talked to a number of his investors, including the folks at Automatic and others, and said, um, hey, here's a, a bunch of information we now know. Um, it turns out 2% is really good. So, hey, stop worrying about minimizing your churn. I mean, keep your eye on it. But even the biggest companies in the world have a hard time getting below 1.5%, and they're awesome at it and have PhDs focused on minimizing churn. So if you're at 2% a month, deal with it. Make sure that your existing customers increase what they spend and that you're acquiring new customers at a rate that exceeds this so you can grow, and go focus on something else, you know, better, um, better series of upgrade paths, cheaper customer acquisition, increased virality, and so on. So that's a good example of that. Uh, let's talk about um, the virality stage. So another company in Year One Labs is a company called Kiddick, and Kiddick uh, was a way of asking polls to very small groups. So you'd basically write an email, um, or you would send an email to people saying, hey, um, I'd like to ask you a question. And so the original model for Kiddick, uh, when they first designed it, was this, that um, they basically would create um, a survey question, you know, do you like eggs? And that survey um, owner would enter a list of people who are going to reply, just email addresses. And those recipients would get an invite, which urged them to either go to the website or install the mobile app. And once they'd done that, they'd create an account and a profile. They could edit their profile. They could view past questions, whatever. Then they read the survey question. They respond to the question, and they see the survey results. And this seemed like a pretty logical thing, but it only gave us a 10 to 25% response rate. And when you think about all the effort you had to go to, that was no fun. I mean, 10 to 25% response rate, we've made someone install a mobile app and so on. So we were a little exasperated, and we said, you know what? Let's eliminate all the things that aren't necessary, shown here in red. So the new workflow is this. I'm going to add your email address. I'm going to ask a question. You're going to get an email. You're going to click on the answer you like, and you'll see the results. Now, at first, you might look at that and say, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, what about all the other stuff you need to do? You don't even, I don't even know my password for this tool. And we said, that's okay because when we do this, we get a 70 to 90% response rate on these surveys. And later on, if you need to, you can visit the website and go, hey, I don't have a password. Well, everyone in the world knows how to do password recovery. We already know your email address. We already know you responded to a question. So you just say, I need to recover my password. You do a password recovery. You get a one-time link. You log in, and now you can edit your profile. They realized that the one metric that mattered to them was the response rate, and they did everything else they needed to to improve the virality of this stuff where people would invite um, others to a poll and get an answer back by moving everything that got in the way of that moment of conversion, that aha moment, till later. And they got the conversion rate from 10 to 25%, which is actually okay, but still not what they were hoping for, to 70 to 90%. Percent. If 70 to 90% percent of the people you sent an email to gave you an answer, you'd be pretty happy. Let's look at the next stage, the revenue stage. So Backupify is a good example. This is a backup and software storage company. And they were trying to move through their revenue stuff. Initially, they focused on metrics like the number of visitors to the site. Then they focused on the trials that they had. Then they focused uh, on the signups they got. Uh, today, they focused on the monthly recurring revenue. But what they realized was that early on, uh, the customer acquisition cost was $243. It was costing them nearly $250 to acquire a customer. And the average revenue per user was only $39. That was a pretty awful model. So they looked at that and said, we need to stop targeting consumers. We need to go focus on business users. And so now their customer lifetime value to customer acquisition cost, meaning how much a customer brings in divided by how much they uh, cost to acquire, is five to six times. So they simply moved from a consumer 
I shouldn't say simply, it's hard to do, but they move from a consumer to a business-to-business model, dramatically incre- improve their, their fortunes. They also track the one metric for them that matters, which is customer acquisition payback. How long does it take to pay back the investment I've made in acquiring a customer? And they want to get that down to less than 12 months. That's a very, very good metric. Remember we talked about acceleration being a great ratio Well, uh, in, a, in driving a car? Well, this is a metric that comprises, comprises so many things. It comprises how efficiently you're acquiring customers. It comprises how good your churn is. It rolls them all up into one thing, which is how long does it take me to pay off what a customer is going to cost me to acquire? And the amazing thing about that is that it also tells you how much investment you're going to need. Because if I have a customer that sticks around for four years on average, but it takes me a year's worth of time to pay them off, then I need at least a year's worth of burn to, um, to pay the bills to get those customers to turn into value. And so I know how much money to ask for an in investment. And this is a much more for- informed kind of investing because um, you go to a VC and say, this is why I need the money. It's much more compelling. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but um, suffice to say that we do have in the book a number of, and I apologize, this doesn't look like it's building the way it was supposed to, so hopefully it will look okay. Um, we do have in the book a number of um, charts that show you the kind of uh, information that you should be looking for. Uh, this is a bit of an eye chart, but if you want to print screen it now, uh, or just buy the book for that matter, um, you'll see that every company in the early stages of empathy is focused on how many interviews am I doing, qualitative feedback, quantitative scoring, survey results, and so on to verify that they're in the right business. During stickiness, that changes a little. If you're in e-commerce, you care about things like loyalty rates and conversion rates, whereas if you're making user-generated content like Reddit or Facebook, you care about the value of content being created versus the spam that's being created. And then as you move later, you care about new metrics. The e-commerce and two-sided market, the metrics are similar because they make their money from transactions. The software as a service and mobile app metrics are similar because they make their money from active users. And the user-generated content and media make their money from ad clicks. And so Um, you really need to say, which business model am I closest to? Now, you may find that you're in more than one business model. Amazon, for example, is in the e-commerce business, but it also has a very vibrant reviews system. And of course, once you've read the book, we'd love it if you went there and took advantage of that to say how great it was. Small plug for the book. The review system is user-generated content. So they care about things like uh, how good is that content, um, how much spam is happening in there, how engaged are users, for example. So, Uh, I could go into this chart for much longer. In fact, it took us about 430 pages to go into it properly, which is why the book is long, because we have to explain each of these cells. But if you don't know what business you're in and what stage you're at, you're going to make bad decisions and you won't focus on the right metrics. I want to give a shout out to a couple of groups that are often neglected in the lean startup world, uh, business to business users and intrapreneurs. So the first group I want to talk about is, you know, there's this business to business stereotype when you're launching a business to business uh, focused company, trying to sell to enterprises. Usually there's a domain expert who knows the industry and the problem domain, wears a Rolodex, and often acts as a proxy for customers. And then someone who brings in the disruption, they say, look, I know that faxes are going to change this industry or that mobile phones are going to change this industry, for example. Um, Oftentimes, if you work in one of these companies, there's also a guy in operations. I'm an operations guy, so I can make that joke. Uh, Typically, there are three ways that a business-to-business startup gets started. One is the enterprise pivot. They create a popular consumer product, uh, like Backup if I did, and then pivot to tackle the enterprise. This is certainly the road that people like Box.net and Dropbox are taking. Uh, The second is to copy and rebuild something. Look at something that's done well in the consumer web and make it enterprise ready. You could argue that Yammer, Map, or companies like that are doing that. And the third is to disrupt an existing problem. So you've got to be 10 times better and then go to the enterprise and convince it that, you know, uh, ERPs for hiring are not good, you should buy Taleo as a software as a service model. Uh, the third one requires that you have a sort of 10x advantage over the old way because there's a lot of inertia in organizations. For these guys, the five stages we talked about are a little different. Um, the empathy stage involves, um, I'm glad you guys like my uh, Tron Ops guy. Uh, so the, uh, the empathy stage uh, involves uh, consulting, doing a lot of testing to find out, have I got the right idea? Can I bootstrap the business? Many business-to-business companies start out doing consulting. And the risk, of course, here is that you're going to get locked in. Your customers will require custom work from you and so on, or that you're going to overfit to the needs of a specific customer. Um, the next stage, stickiness, is where you standardize. You're moving from, I've done custom work for 20 customers, to a generic thing while still making sure that those customers uh, are using the 
And the challenge here is really, will it integrate? So that in most enterprises, you've got legacy systems you have to work with that drive up your support costs. So here, stickiness is often number of support calls. Can I integrate well? How long does it take to do the deployment? How much uh, support am I dealing with? At the virality stage, you can't really, you know, you don't get an enterprise buyer who goes out and tweets his friends to try out this new ERP. So you're focused much more on word of mouth, references, and case studies. And you have to fear things like bad vibes or exclusivity where a bank says, I won't act as a reference because I don't want you getting any other banks as customers. In the revenue stage, you're growing your direct sales team. You're getting further from the customer, which to a lean startup person is always risky. And you care about things like revenue recognition, pipeline management, compensation, uh, because that's your cost. And then in the scale stage, um, you really care about channels, analysts, ecosystems, going after a specific vertical. And here you're worried about the 800-pound gorillas and crossing the chasm. So the stages are still there, but they look different when you're focused on enterprises. DJ Patil famously said something he calls the zero overhead principle. And I think this is a really big deal. Um, he says, no feature may add training costs to the user. These days when we're selling stuff to businesses, the, one, of the, one of the table stakes is that the thing you're doing will replace something that's broken or old or disruptive. Uh, it'll disrupt in a good way. And so a very good rule of thumb is don't ever break um, the training costs that the user has today. People should just know how it works. No one needs to be told how to use Facebook. Your software should not be an exception. The next one is the intrapreneur business. So the other group that is often overlooked by lean startup is people who work within an organization. Uh, Lockheed Martin had this problem in World War II as uh, World War II was rolling across Europe. The Americans decided they needed something to combat the threat of jet aircraft coming out of Germany. And so Lockheed Martin stuck a bunch of people in a circus tent next to a paint factory. That's why it was called the Skunk Works because it stank. And within 10 months, they had a prototype of a jet aircraft. There were a lot of things that worked for that. Um, they were separated from the organization. They were given the latitude to go and make um, big changes and so on. And they um, did a fantastic job because they had authority, they had backing, they had a mandate, they had enough distance, they were still accountable, so it worked really well. In many cases, intrapreneurs work best when they are treated like skunk works within organizations. Now, there's a reason you hate your job, and it's this guy. His name is Daniel McCallum. McCallum was a uh, Civil War veteran who ran a railroad, and he noticed that all the railroads at the time were very profitable until they got more than 50 miles long. Once they got 50 miles long, um, things broke down. Confusion, errors, trains not running on time, and so on. And so McCallum realized that he would borrow an idea from military structure and create an organizational chart. Um, McCallum said, we're going to have people who run each 50-mile long length, and we're going to have someone else that spans that control, and so on. And so this idea of spanning control means that companies typically favor scale and span of control and predictability over uh, learning and adaptability. And this is a big issue because if you're an intrapreneur trying to do lean stuff, your whole focus is trying to change the status quo. And Daniel McCallum's whole idea is trying to protect the status quo. This, again, is why you hate your job. If you can't work in that environment, go start a company. But if you can work in that environment, you'll probably wind up doing one of four things. This grid here is called the Boston Consulting Group Matrix, or the BCG box. And most of you have probably heard of the word cash cows. If you've got a big business background, this was drilled into your head, that there are uh, four kinds of companies, dogs, question marks, stars, and cash cows. You qualify them by the size of their market and the rate at which they're growing. So a question mark is growing really fast, but has a very small market share. It's got a lot of promise. A star is growing fast in a big market. A cash cow owns a large market share, but that market's not growing very fast and a dog has neither and is usually either sold off or shut down. Most intrapreneur work within a company involves trying to move dogs into question marks by increasing the growth rate of the market, involves moving question marks into stars by increasing market share, in involves making the stars um, survive to become cash cows as um, the market growth diminishes, so reducing costs and making them more efficient, um, or pivoting the cash cow into a new market where it can grow again. Um, lean, in this case, is about moving up and to the right, trying to get things over to the stars uh, and also getting rid of the inefficiencies. And so one of the challenges that um, people always have here is trying to understand how to make a business change in this way. I'll give you a quick example of this with Swiffer. Uh, P&G uh, was constantly looking for better cleaning products, but innovation was slowing down. And they kept trying different surfactants, and none of them worked very well. So uh, eventually what they did is they had done a heavy amount of internal R&D, but they brought in an outside agency. And I should note that um, this story is dis disputed by a number of people. There are lots of different versions of what happened. So uh, your mileage may vary depending on who you talk to. 
Um, but they brought in an outside agency continuum on that, on that much, everyone agrees. And the team watched people as they mopped up and recorded what they did. And they watched someone pick up spilled coffee. And rather than mopping, that person swept up with a broom and then wiped the cloth. And they realized that it was the device, not the liquid, that mattered. So they studied how much floor dirt um, consisted of dust and so on. And they launched the Swiffer. Now, Swiffer introduced a half a billion dollar innovation in an industry that was fairly stagnant and, and was, was sitting around because they went all the way back to the empathy stage, got inside the mind of the customer, realized the product different, and then changed it. Um, that means that if you're an entrepreneur, the first thing you should do before you even get to the empathy stage is get buy-in because you need to fear political fallout. If you don't have authority the way the Skunk Works did, you're going to have a problem. Assuming you can get that, your empathy in, as an entrepreneur is really to find problems. Don't go testing demand. If you ask people if they wanted a Walkman or a minivan, they'd say no. You can find problems. People are commuting and they like some time to themselves. Ergo, they want a Walkman. Um, they can talk about um, uh, skipping. They can talk about uh, driving kids around on the weekend. Ergo, they need a minivan. And also skip the business case. Do the analytics. Run a little experiment and see what's happening. So if you have a lot of data, as big companies do, you have a huge advantage. I mean, ask yourself, why is Blockbuster not Netflix? They had all the data, they had all the movies, they had all the customers. They were just too afraid to experiment. Of course. Um, the risk here is when you go to a customer and ask them for something, they're going to be aggrieved or feel entitled, so it's difficult to get honest answers out of them. Later on, when you move to the stickiness stage, you need to be concerned about the real minimum, what, you really need, what your real limitations are based on expectations and regulations. Because if you're in a big industry, you may have hidden must-haves that you don't know about. You may have feature creep, and so you really need to find ways to limit that. Uh, in the virality stage, um, you're going to focus on building inherent virality in from the start. In most cases, Everything you do, you should look at how do I bake virality into the feature or the product because um, this is really what you're going to disrupt. You already have large market share in a known market. You now have to figure out how to disrupt that market, and you have to fear people who don't understand sharing and worry about privacy concerns. Uh, in the revenue model, you have to consider existing agreements you have. So, for example, if you're Microsoft trying to, in, trying to introduce a live office product, you have to introduce, you have to consider the impact that's going to have on sales of licenses and, and the uh, resistance from your sales force. And finally, scale, the big challenge for entrepreneurs is how do you hand that baton gracefully to someone else? Because you're going to hate what they do to your baby. And if you're not okay with that, don't be an entrepreneur. But again, these stages are still there. They still apply even if you're working inside an organization. Now, I want to conclude with this, that Lloyd Nelson once said, the most important figures that one needs for management are unknown or unknowable. But successful management must nevertheless take account of them. That sounds like a bit of a paradox. We think you should choose only one metric. And yeah, we know it's hard to do that, but we really do mean only one metric. And there's a reason for that, because that metric is soon, is soon going to change. In a startup, your scarcest resource is focus. Focus is really hard to achieve, and having only one metric addresses this problem. Because metrics are like squeeze toys. When you take a metric and you squeeze it, you optimize it, something else is going to bulge out, and that's the next metric you're going to go optimize. So you keep going through these iterative cycles of optimization, and that's a huge issue, right? Most people spend a lot of time wondering um, what, what they should measure. The reality is measure the thing that matters the most to you where you have the most uncertainty, and then go back and fix it next week because it will be a different metric. That's huge. So I want to leave you with this thought, and then I'll take a couple of questions within the time we've got left. Um, Archimedes had taken baths before. Anybody know the story of Archimedes? Basically, um, Archimedes is, um, Archimedes is, uh, was a guy who was asked by the king to check if a crown that the king had received was fake. So basically the king said, hey, I got this crown. I think I got ripped off. Could you measure its density? And Archimedes went, hmm, that's a problem. How do I measure the density of a, an irregularly shaped so, uh, solid? And the story goes that he jumped in the bathtub, watched the water line move up, and realized that the displacement of water in a bathtub was a great way to measure volume. Historical evidence shows that he was actually much more clever than that and figured out other ways to do it using balances and so on, but it's a nice story. The point here is that Archimedes had taken baths before. It's not like this was his first bath. I mean, maybe he was a really smelly guy, but I'm not sure. I don't think it was his first bath. The point is that the king asked him a question which caused him to find the answer. Once upon a time, in an era before abundant data, leaders convinced others what to do in the absence of that data. They're John Hamm in Mad Men saying, isn't it amazing? Think of the carousel. Won't it be good? They're a proxy for your market. But a leader today knows what questions to ask. That's the real role of a leader. And so 
we say at the end of the book that we want you to go forth and ask good questions, because without good questions, the metrics mean nothing. So a couple of quick points. Uh, hopefully this was useful. It was a whirlwind tour in an hour of the book. Uh, there's lots of content in there. Uh, I'm going to answer a couple of questions if I can. Um, and I saw Yasmina's tweeting at the, uh, or messaging at the Lean Analytics um, t-shirt store, which we haven't actually announced yet, but there's some cute shirts there. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now, if you buy the book, uh, I help run an event in Montreal called the International Startup Festival at startupfest.com. And um, if you buy the book and you tell us so, either through a form or uh, online, or technically if you don't buy the book because we're not allowed to hold contests that you have to buy something for, that would be a lottery, um, we will put you into the draw um, to, for a number of prizes. In fact, we just added some more today uh, from a variety of vendors in this space putting together startup bundles. But the grand prize is that Ben and I will cough up $1,500 of our own money to fly you um, and pay for your uh, travel to Montreal in the summer in July. And um, you will get to hang out with us, come to the workshop that we're running along with the authors of uh, Lean Entrepreneur. That also hasn't been announced yet. Um, and we'll hang out with you. You get to come to a speaker's dinner with all the cool speakers that are attending, and it's just an amazing time to come to Montreal in the middle of the uh, comedy festival. So um, I know the book is half price today. We'd love it if you guys uh, bought a copy. We'd love it even more if once you read it, you told us what you thought, good or bad, on the blog, uh, rated it on Amazon. Um, as you can tell from the fast pace of this, there's a lot of content in there. Uh, this is me and this is Ben, and I did that in exactly an hour, so I'll take as many questions as Yasmina will let me. Thanks. Alistair, thank you so much for an outstanding presentation today. As you can see, by all the comments coming in, folks really enjoyed it, and there, there are lots and lots of questions. Um, are you able to see them, or did you want me to read them? Uh, you can go ahead. That's fine. All righty. We'll take them the order they came in. Um, Andres would like to know, do you have any literature suggestions for the empathy phase? <laughs> uh, so the first suggestion would be a book you may have heard of called Lean Analytics. Um, <laughs> but in addition to that, there's a very good book by Ash Meyer called Running Lean. It's also part of the same O'Reilly series. Um, and it talks about customer development. So there are a lot of things you can do wrong, uh, things like uh, going in and asking leading questions, uh, getting too quantitative too soon, all those kinds of issues. Um, and yeah, the empathy stage, there's a lot of work that can be done there. Uh, it's almost like psychology. I mean, you're sort of hacking your customer's uh, mind and expectations to try and understand what their real needs are rather than the ones they think they have. Um, I would say look at Ash's book. It's great. Uh, his blog is really good too, uh, Running Lean. Uh, Eric Rees obviously has written a lot of that stuff. And um, I would say be very interested in interviewing. One of the best tricks I've ever learned, and you wouldn't believe this from listening to me talk or if you know me in person, is to say nothing for 20 seconds. You'd be amazed how awkward that feels. See, it's really awkward. Um, <laughs> and that was like three seconds. Thank you for not interrupting. I mean, you would have stolen my joke. But uh, there's a bunch of things like that are interesting. So. Um, I'd say check out Ash, check out Eric Rees' stuff. Uh, Patrick Vosadis and um, uh, Brant Cooper have a book called Lean Entrepreneur. There's a bunch of good books on this. And we do go into this in quite a lot of detail. There's a whole chapter on each of the stages with lots of information. Perfect. We'll take a couple more questions here. I know we are starting to run over on time. Um, Dietrich would like to know, there was a lot of discussion about metrics. Can Alistair talk about data capture strategies? Anything in particular to look for related to data capture? Sure. So. Um, the reality is that for many companies, Google Analytics is kind of like a spreadsheet. I mean, people don't really think of Excel anymore. They think of a spreadsheet. It's where you go to do numbers. Uh, Google Analytics is often where you do to collect data. Um, but more and more, you're seeing verticalization of tools to do data capture. So for example, if you're doing mobile, you're looking at Flurry. If you're a SaaS provider, you're looking at Tatango. If you're media, you're looking at Chartbeat and so on. And um, I think the, the strategies there are storage is so damn cheap, capture everything. You don't know what you're going to want to analyze later on. You won't find those correlations until later on. And so there's definitely a um, – people je definitely defer to uh, capture everything stored just in case, um, and then look at some of the new tools that are coming out around a particular vertical industry. Perfect. Um, next question here from Paul. What kinds of businesses have to constantly reevaluate what model they are in? What kind of businesses seldom have to reevaluate re what they're in? Acquisition, hybrid, loyalty. Sure. So it, um, one of the things we learned is it's very rare for companies to move from an acquisition focus to a loyalty focus. Um, it actually is very hard to move that needle. And uh, it's really, really tough to see the two. So um, what you have to find is, is a way of um, uh, doubling down on the business you're in and then maybe 
changing or creating a secondary business. So, you know, if you're selling engagement rings and you're only selling one, you could double down on that, do massive acquisition, but then maybe you open a side business for wedding planning that becomes a marketplace for wedding planners. And then, you know, it's more about diversifying from your existing market um, and finding other things. So, I mean, if I'm being incredibly cynical, maybe I open a divorce proceedings website um, so I can get at least the second sale out of everybody who's got an engagement ring. <laughs> I'm a really cynical person, aren't I? <laughs> Very good. If you have just a couple more minutes, Alistair, we do have just a couple more questions. Sure. All right. Michael would like to know, if your two target customers set a mutually influential but success – let me read it again. I'm sorry. If your two target customers sets are mutually influential but success depends on building one to strengthen first, which will enable the second – Will there be examples in your book of parallel analytics activities that might vary by stage? Yeah, so Michael, that's a good question. The most obvious example of this is a two-sided marketplace. Two-sided marketplaces um, suffer from a chicken and egg problem. And one of the best ways to tackle a chicken and the egg problem is to find out who's got the money and then artificially inflate the other half. So uh, Uber, for example, when they opened up in Seattle, um, simply paid all the limo drivers 30 bucks an hour to sit around with their engines idling until someone called because the riders had the money and they knew that the limo drivers would be happy to take 30 bucks an hour until um, things grew. So that allowed Uber to build an artificial supply. Um, in the case, so if you have two competing groups that are both um, in a marketplace like that, figure out who's got the money and then create the other one artificially. Um, that's always a good rule of thumb. The other thing I would say is if you've got to choose between different groups, um, test marketing to the two groups and see which one has a higher viral coefficient or a lower viral cycle time or a lower cost of acquisition and then focus on that one. Um, what you've got there is a classic example of an experiment to run. Try and figure out your two groups, test which one's most influential and double down on that one. Wonderful. Um, next question here from John. From your presentation, I think that the Kazen concept cuts across the stages, that the best way to manage the stages is to create a Kazen culture. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. So it, he says, if it's in your book, I just bought it and we'll be devouring it ASAP. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, John. Glad you're devouring it. Um, hopefully, it's not the ebook because that that might give you indigestion. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, Kaizen is absolutely one of the things that would Kaizen and TQM and Six Sigma were the things that influenced Eric Ries' thinking. Um, getting close to the customer and a constant cycle of iteration. And really, I do think that that a competitive advantage in the future will come not from scale, but from one's ability to iterate quickly um, and close to the uh, the uh, customer. So. Uh, many of the things we talk about are increasing the cycle time. There's actually something I didn't get into in this presentation, the lean analytics cycle, which is this sort of constant cycle of running experiments and identifying commonalities in the data. Fantastic. And with that, we'll finish with a final question from Evan. Um, he says, Alistair, how do you think about testing when measurable metrics are very few and very low, like not many users? Uh, I pick up the phone. I think you have an interesting world there where you can get to know your existing customers very well because you can afford to talk to them, and you should. Um, and you should ask them how they found out about you, know everything about them. This is the early stage of a company. Uh, we had one company that um, for a while had only 100 uh, customers but knew everything about them. They were in forums. They were users. They were able to validate things just by talking to them. And the key there is figuring out um, what metrics are most important to those people, but not jumping to quantification too soon. Because you may find that one epiphany that comes from talking to one customer that suddenly makes you realize, wow, it turns out that's the business I'm in. You know, Flickr going, hey, you told me these people keep saying they're using their, the system for photography. Maybe we should be a photo site. Um, and so I think about measure when they're, when they're very few and very low and you can't find statistical samples, uh, and this is often the case in the B2B model, uh, a lot of it's customer development. The other thing you can do is, let's say you're making a product for law offices and you have like 20 customers. There are 20 law offices that are using your product. You can call them, but you can also go create LinkedIn or Facebook or Google ads with great deal of targeting and try out different messages and try out different offers and see which ones get the most clicks. Even if you're just saying, take the, hey, are you a lawyer? Do you have a problem with you know, your, your paper filing? Click here to take the survey and we'll share the results with you. You'll probably get a couple of hundred clicks on that. You can try out lots of different messages, see which one resonates the most, get data, acquire another 100 emails. Now you've got a prospect list of 100 emails. You know which metric hunted best, uh, which, which uh, slogan hunted best, and you've got survey data which you can use for content marketing. So, you may not have a lot of users to test, but there's a whole internet full of prospects that you can run experiments on. Fantastic. And with that, we are a little bit over on time. Folks, thank you so much for sending in your questions because having those questions just adds so much more to our events. 
we would like to say a very big thank you to you, Alistair, for spending time with us today and for sharing all your knowledge and expertise. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. Super. And folks, we'd like to let you all know, please open that group chat if you didn't open it yet because there's some great information in there to save you some money today on Alistair's book, Lean Analytics. It is the O'Reilly Deal of the Day, and what that means for you is you can get it today at a great price. So we've pushed out details on that as well. Visit O'Reilly.com. Look on the right-hand side. You can't miss it. It's right there. If you enjoyed hearing Alistair's presentation today, the book has lots more in it that will certainly help you with your day-to-day. -day. Again, thank you, Alistair. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude our webcast. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, guys.